go to Mark chapter 5. I want to say just a little bit more about that. I'm not saying by any means that, that these other people aren't saved. But, you know, the Great Commission in Matthew says we're to teach him all things that the Lord taught. If we're not endeavoring to do that, and if we're not continually learning and actually relearning, um, the next generation is going to be apostate. They're going to fall away. I was just thinking uh, in the last couple of days, I probably need to preach a sermon on alcohol and you might think well we all we all know alcohol is wrong <laughs> but you know Peter said it he said I'm going to endeavor as long as he was alive he's going to keep repeating and keep making sure that that we know these things because I'm not the only one who's forgetful you know, spiritually, we have to be strengthened and encouraged and um, cover these things. So, anyway, it's kind of like um, most people. I mean, I, I didn't really see. I grew up in a liberal church, so I didn't really see the value of church. And I was reading somebody that said, you know, you can seek the Lord anywhere, and that's absolutely true. They said no place is better than another, but Jesus said where two or three are gathered together in my name, and that's not a Bible study. He's talking about a church there. It's one of the first place in the New Testament, second place in the New Testament. Where the only one of only two places in the, New, in the Gospels where the word church is mentioned, where, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And yet, that prank that although everybody can quote that verse, they don't even know what the context is. It's a context of church discipline. And a church, even a small one, having the authority of God to discipline its members, the responsibility to do that. And my, my thinking is if, if, if a church doesn't practice church discipline, it if it's, if it's fairly doctrinally sound, it won't be long if it doesn't do that. I, I regard that as a, an essential of having a New Testament church. And maybe you can think about that a little bit. All right, Mark chapter 5, verse 1 says, And they came over unto the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadarenes, and when he's come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. Now, I forget which one of the other Gospels. Probably, I think it's Luke. It says there were two men. And so what we would understand, here, what's the problem there? Are they contradicting? No. One man apparently was a far more aggressive uh, whatever in uh, and being controlled by the demons. But anyway, so there are, both of these are talking about the same place. Verse 2, when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. Because that he had been bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces. Neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. Yet, all the time, the word in, worshipped in the New Testament has to do with sometimes literally, but being prostrated on the ground, getting 
on your face, on your knees before uh, the Lord. So I'm assuming that's what he did. He ran and worshipped him and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God, the Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he, had said unto, for he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now there was there nigh unto the mountain a great herd of swine feeding. And all the devils besought him. So apparently multiple voices at this point. All the devils besought him saying, Send us into the swine that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave. And the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine. And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. And they were about 2,000 and were choked into the sea, in the sea. By the way, I just uh, read, read in the commentary that uh, pigs can't run downhill fast. They can't do this. Ordinarily, they wouldn't do something like that. Verse 14, And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that was done. And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind. And they were afraid. And they that saw it told them how it fell to them, to him that was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coast. Now again, uh, one of the other Gospels says there's a multitude of people, virtually the whole city and people in the countryside, so possibly thousands of people uh, coming out to see what was going on. Uh, so verse 18, And when he was coming to the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends, and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee, and hath compassion on thee. And he departed, and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. That's the end of the paragraph there. The title of our message tonight is Two Prayers. Two Prayers. Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, I pray that you would teach each of us. Uh, Father, we might be confident of thy power. We might understand some of the challenges before us. And Lord, that we would, again, have a faith that um, is eager to do your will. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. A friend of mine who's a serious student of the Word of God gave me an article to read that he had written a number of years ago. He wanted to see what I thought about it. And the basic premise of the article is that somebody's true character, spiritual character, and their desires are not re revealed as much by their actions as they are by your reactions. In other words, his, his point was that when people have time to think through a decision, they, they may follow principles that they've been taught or they make decisions based on some uh, general values, ethics, standards, um, or principles, you know, of the people that are around us, how they've grown up, whatever the culture, society is. But in contrast to a situation like that, when somebody's forced to react to something or decide very quickly, what they show then is the raw principles that actually rule them 
what their nature, what their character really is. For example, a man may be rude to his family, treat them disrespectfully in his everyday home life as he reacts to circumstances around him. Uh, you know, he's maybe controlled by his temper or the real character of his nature. But if, if he has company or if he's at church or if he has some time to think over the situation, he may be more careful about how he acts. And so now he's governed by the values of the people around him or some higher principle than actually just his raw character, his true nature. One thing is certain about this is in the Bible we see that uh, Jesus knew what people were thinking. Obviously, he's God. He knew what people were thinking, and he knew what their true nature was. And not only that, but Jesus had a unique ability to provoke people to publicly reveal that true nature. You know, we have a number of places where it says that people were trying to catch him. <laughs> and what happened when he responded to them is they revealed what they really were. Of course, he was never hiding anything. He was always up front about all that. But when people are around him and around what he was doing and what he was saying and preaching, it, it really provoked people uh, one way or the other. One of the most revealing responses that people have uh, is how they respond to a genuine work of salvation or redemption from sin. Uh, Jesus said in Luke 15, 7, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. So Jesus there saying that angels have great rejoicing if just one person is saved. And what he's indicating there, of course, he talks about um, uh, joy in heaven. Um, he, he's, he's talking about angels who have a nature exactly like God, perfectly holy, and so forth. Uh, and so they have the nature of God, and they're demonstrating their rejoicing um, shows the, the nature of God, what he's doing, what he thinks, how he responds. And therefore, when, when Jesus is saying you know, these, why these angels rejoice, he's he just revealing what causes God to greatly rejoice. One sinner, more than 99 just persons. Now, our passage records one of the most dramatic, I believe, one of the most powerful examples of salvation recorded in all the Bible, and that's Jesus' deliverance of a man, and apparently two men, who were delivered from being possessed by thousands of demons. I don't know that for a fact, but I, I believe a legion, I'm going to hold back, I know it's at least 600, uh, maybe a, a, a few thousand, so, and it says there, I pointed out, verse 17, they begin to pray him to depart out of their coast. They begin to request. They made a prayer to the Lord uh, to, uh, for him to, no, excuse me, that's the, well, that was the people there, but the demons asked him not to send them into uh, uh, verse, verse 10. He said he, he besought him much that he would not send them, send them away out of the country. So I had really no, no exact idea of how many demons there were. Uh, but obviously a very powerful, we would think unusual uh, situation. However, Jesus coming in contact with people who were deemed possessed was not uncommon. Uh, some missionaries apparently see this kind of thing. I think we just don't recognize demon possession. I believe it's very, pretty common around us here in the United States now. But while this certainly 
reveals the power of Christ to save souls, it also powerfully reveals the true nature, the true spiritual nature of people who observe the work of God. Their response was re revealed in their prayers. We had the prayers by the man who had been redeemed, and we had the prayers, both the same word, same Greek word, uh, the prayers of the people who heard about it and saw this man that had been transformed. They both prayed. They asked Jesus something. And though the angels in heaven rejoice with God when one sinner is redeemed, the unsaved fear when souls are saved, lest it interfere with their life and their treasures on earth. And this is something we ought to expect. I want us to note, first of all, the miserable condition of an enslaved soul in these first ten verses. Of course, he was controlled by an unclean spirit. Verse 1 says, And when they came over to the other side of the sea in the country of the Gadarenes, and when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. In all this passage, it talks about his superhuman strength and uh, it, one of the other Gospels talks about how he had attacked people that had come by that way. But Jesus is there with disciples, and this guy comes, apparently comes running out, uh, perhaps not realizing who he was going to meet, but um, he's controlled by these demons, evil spirits, unclean spirits. Now, Have you ever been around somebody and just felt dirty after being around them? Well, there are plenty of places you can go to meet people like that. Brother Wright used to work in a place. Well, maybe it's more than one. But I used to work there at the Durham Rescue Mission. And... These are people who, who didn't carry anything, most of them, with whether they were clean, how they talked, how they lived. But if, if you have a demon who is the totally opposite character of God controlling your life, and not just one, but hundreds I can't even comprehend the condition that this man was in. He was controlled by that. Now, we're controlled by our, our lust, and I do believe that demons have an influence, play a role in that at times. It, not that we're, they play a role in, at times, but at times when we're controlled by these desires, we don't bring them under control. It, it's, it's a terrible situation to be in. And, of course, this man was hostile to the Son of God. Verse 2 and 3, When he's come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. And as I said, uh, he did attack people, and apparently that's what he planned to do with Jesus and his disciples. And there were, there were two of them, but I don't think two of them were afraid of 12 or 13 or more that were with Jesus. Um, again, you'll, you'll meet people like this. I was mentioning a, a fellow earlier, but there's some people, if, if you simply mention, and you may work with some of them, if you simply mention something to the Bible, they've got to say something. Uh, they've got to condemn what you believe or make fun of you, mock you or things like that. Maybe you have somebody like that in your family who they're hostile to the Son of God and to people who are walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. And this man was comfortable in an unclean environment. So he lived among the tombs. Now, of course, we know in the Old Testament, a, uh, a dead body was considered unclean. If, uh, if you were around 
you know, somebody when they died or whatever, you came across a body, even an animal, you had to go through a cleansing process. And it was supposed to be spiritual as well. This guy lived in a place like that. Um, and again, I, most of us are not too young. And I don't know how protected your lives have been. But um, I, I've been in houses before where I mean, the, the idea of any kind of cleanness is just like animals living there in filth. Uh, I know my wife worked on a, a bus route that went through a pretty, pretty rough, some pretty rough air, uh, areas. And, you know, she would have to go in and get the children, sometimes help them get dressed, right? to get ready and go to the church because their parents didn't care anything. They, they may have been sleeping off a, you know, a drunk, um, who knows, using drugs or whatever. But this guy, was, he, was, he was comfortable there. That's where he lived. He didn't want to be around people like the Lord Jesus. And he was beyond help from human efforts. In verse 4, he says, because they had been bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. Now, people probably would have thought, why did, why did Jesus go through there? Everybody knows that crazy man is there. And then it says, uh, verse 9 he asked him, what is thy name? And he answered and said, my name is Legion, for we are many. Uh, in verse 13, it says, and with, forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. For they were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. So they had absolute destructive control over the pigs once they got out of this man. But... I mean, you couldn't even give this guy a tranquilizer because he, he couldn't be stopped. He couldn't be held down. Not just leather straps or something like that, but we're, it says chains. And, you know, my thinking is how do you even break chains? Wouldn't that break your, your bones if you were that powerful enough to, to break metal chains? And so he, he definitely had some, what we would call supernatural, or I should say supranatural, I guess. Um, nobody could stop him. Nobody could help him. Um, this kind of reminds me, there's a conservative psychiatrist um, that a lot of people listen to. He's on the Daily Wire. Jordan Peterson. Smart guy. Says a lot of good things, but he, he is not a saved man. And a guy like that is not a guy that can help you. He, he can't control himself. He, he's open to the the rule or direction of demons. He's not under the power of the Holy Spirit. And so here's a guy that, I mean, <laughs> you know, 2,000 pigs killed themselves, and here's a guy that's cutting himself, crying. He, in fact, that's the next point. All of his actions inflicted pain and misery upon himself. Verse 5. Always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. Maybe that's where they got the, the uh, idea for the wolf man howling, out running around. And that's the thing about unsaved people they are inflicting pain on themselves, they're bringing mental anguish. 
They're angry. They're depressed. They're, you name it. They're having it, but they're mad at God. And they're mad at Christians. But they're the ones that are bringing these situations upon themselves. Drugs, immorality, hatred, worry. So here's this guy. He's, he's actually tormented, and, uh, but he doesn't want to meet the Lord. That's the last person he wants to meet. He was tormented by the fear of the one who could and who wanted to deliver him. Again, verse 6. But when he saw Jesus fall off, he ran and worshipped him and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. Well, I'll say one thing. He had a lot more understanding than, than a, what do we say, 70% of the ministers in the United States. He, he believed that Jesus was the son of God. Think about all the people in pulpits today who don't, who don't believe that. But he was tormented. He was fearful. He was afraid Jesus was going to send him to hell right then. He comes and worships Jesus, and that was pretty smart. And Jesus wanted to deliver him, but this guy was afraid of him. Now, I think that is one of the primary things that lost people have to overcome to get saved. I know it was for me. I thought that if I got saved, and I grew up in around church, I was around Christian people all the time, you know, had good parents and all that, but I was afraid that if I got saved, that life wouldn't be fun anymore. Life would be unhappy. And I, I've told this over and over, but Fortunately, I read John 10.10, 10, The thief cometh not for, it to, for it to steal and to kill and to destroy, but I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. And this guy doesn't believe it. He doesn't believe it because 2,000, that's how many, I'm assuming there are about that many demons, 2,000 demons are telling him he is coming to judge you. He's coming to ruin your life. He's miserable now, but wait till Jesus gets a hold of you. And that's what people all over America have been taught. So here's an enslaved soul. He's in a miserable condition. That's, that's something, that is a, a natural response of the human nature to dread, to hate, to resent the Lord Jesus, the only one who really truly wants to help them. And sometimes that's something we need to focus on. I mean, they can't figure it out for themselves that God himself became a man and lived and died for us and bore our all that pain and misery. He bore it for us but we think he's out to spoil a life for us. Well, let's look at this almighty deliverance by the Son of God. Verse 6 says, But when he saw Jesus fall off, he ran and worshipped him, and cried with a loud voice, and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. I mean, how much worse did he off do you think he could get? Verse 8, For he said unto them, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now there was there nigh to the mountains a great herd of swine feeding, and all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave. And the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. So you got 2,000, you know, by the time some of those later people, 2,000 bloated 
drowned pigs there in the lake. And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was that was done. And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and clothed and in his right mind, uh, sitting and clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. Well, the first thing, well, let me read verse 20 as well. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. But the, the first point I want to make is that Jesus delivered him where he was. Now, it's true, people don't have to go to church to get saved. But a lot of people think, I, I, I have to do something where I get to the place where I can be saved. Well, you're already in the place where you can be saved. You're lost. And the Lord comes to us. Some people do seek the Lord, but the, the idea of having seekers is God seeking us that's the only reason anybody's ever saved this man didn't have to get a bath he didn't have to get clothes on he didn't have to reform for a while or anything like that he was saved immediately now I'm going to tell you this just like the Corinthians he had a long way to go before he would be you know, a mature disciple. There's some things that changed immediately, but he had a long way to go. I wouldn't be surprised if this guy had an urge at times to get out and just get away from everybody and live out from, from time to time. But the Lord took him where he was and completely delivered him from all these demons. He didn't have to leave something. You know, a person that works in a bar, a person that's a prostitute, a, a person in whatever situation, they don't have to change. They just have to come to the Lord, and he will change them. And Jesus, of course, has power all over all other powers. In, in verse Two, he's got this unclean spirit. He's, it doesn't say anything about the size of this guy. I think he must have looked like a UFC guy or something like that or some MMA guy or something, but we don't know. But we know this, he was breaking chains. He was cutting himself. He was living away from everybody else out in the grave sites. And remember... This is probably in, in these tombs or probably in caves and stuff like that. He's probably living right in there with dead bodies. And Jesus had power, complete power over anything that would oppose him. Verse 6, it said, but when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshiped him. And that wasn't just the man. That was, that was all those demons that were in him as well. They worshipped. They were the ones that were pleading with Jesus not to send him to hell. And certainly, this is what people, we need to deal with people's fears about this, but Jesus has come to deliver, not to torment souls. I remember from a sophomore in high school, our English, my English teacher, had some of us had gotten saved by that time, and uh, she was a you know young, smart, educated teacher. You know, we had sinners in the hands of an angry God in our English literature book, and she said some comment about you know the Puritans and all that and how they lived and what a miserable life that must have been. And there were several who said, no, that sounds like heaven. Sounds like a great life to have. And she was just totally flabbergasted that we would say something like that. But that's the way people think. 
And a lot of times it is going to cost them. We'll get, come back to that later, but this guy thinks he... Imagine a guy living like that. He's naked. He's cutting himself. He's living in all these things going on. And he thinks Jesus has come to torment him. It tells you how much messed up his mind was. And so Jesus completely, this guy is completely transformed. And his deliverance of this one man would have brought, potentially brought benevolence to the city and to the country. Uh, in verse 10, he sought him, he sought him much, they would not send him away out of the country. There's pigs there, you know, pigs is that's unclean. There were both Gentiles, supposedly, and Jews live in this area, but you got to believe that uh, there, there's some uncleanness there. If you got Jewish people and perhaps doing the, running this business, certainly they weren't to eat any pork or anything like that, but just to be around an unclean animal, um, probably not following the Old Testament too closely. And... They've got, here's a man that's violent. <laughs> this is not a place where you'd let your kids go walking. Now, you wouldn't go for a picnic in this community. And the pigs were all killed. They drowned themselves. And the, the ones that had the, the pigs, the hogs, verse 14, it says, they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country and they went out to see what it was that was done and they come to Jesus and see him that possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind and they were afraid and they that saw it told them how it befell him that was possessed of the devil and also concerning the swine well you didn't I mean, the guy didn't wear clothes. That's one thing. You've got a, a pervert. You don't have to worry about your family saying something like that. He's, he's not going to be attacking people. He's destroyed the, the hog business. You know... There have been plenty of examples through history, and here in the United States, people that sell alcohol and doing drugs and all this stuff, and they get saved. And several people get saved. You can read stories like this. I don't, I don't know how long it's been something like this in the United States, but entire towns just completely change from boozing and drugging and prostitution and all this, and it is cleaned up. Because people get saved. You know, if you live up in, well, just pick on West Virginia. If you live in West Virginia or Western North Carolina or in the mountains of Virginia or something like that, and you're around moonshining, people that are selling stuff that will kill you and destroy your life and your family, and they will kill you if you mess with their business. You get rid of somebody like that, or they were to get converted, <laughs> start going to church, stop the profanity, stop their fighting, stop their stealing, and the crime rate's going to go down. Potentially, this deliverance of this one, or actually two men, would have been benevolent to the entire community, the entire region. It, it, it says the city and the country. Everybody knew about this guy. And yet he, the almighty deliverance of the Son of God, potentially brought transformation to their community. You know, I'm, I'm thinking 
one of these guys became demon possessed and he probably had a role in the other guy becoming demon possessed you know they 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 want these sodomites to be teachers and to have equal rights and all that stuff but the only way you can become one of those is by somebody else introducing you to it it's unnatural and so here's a guy that's involved in who knows what all and Jesus delivers him what a tremendous impact that would have had on that whole region well this is where we come to the divergent prayers of believing people I say believe in people because they both believe Jesus had the power to save. Verse 14 says, And they that fed the swine fled and came to the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that was done, and they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. They were afraid. And they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine. So there were people out there herding those swine, those hogs, and they saw the whole thing. They saw this man run up to Jesus and the disciples. And they're probably thinking, they're, they're probably yelling and telling him, stop, hey, there, there's a guy over here and they see him run up and he, he gets on the ground. <laughs> they have saw all of it. But it says, in verse 16, And they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine. They, they saw that. I, I don't know what they saw when that, when that man was freed of those demons. But all of a sudden, those, their, their hogs went on the suicide dip. But notice what it says in verse 17. And they begin to pray him to depart out of their coast. <coughs> that means to ask, to request. That's what the word pray means. But it's the same word that's used in the New Testament when we're talking about, about praying. We, we saw about John, uh, Paul this morning. He told Ananias, Behold, he prayeth. I mean, Paul was a religious man. He was supposed to be doing that every day. But the difference with him well, now is he was genuinely praying. But these people are genuinely praying too. But they're praying, Would you please leave our community? What a prayer. They were obviously aware of the power of Christ. And I think the reason they wanted to believe is because they'd seen all these pigs destroyed at somebody's business. They probably lost a lot of money, so probably they were afraid of the cost of following the Lord themselves. You know, it used to be, if, uh, if you were a Christian, you, you couldn't sell alcohol. You know, we've got some good friends up in the Burlington area who do. They run a, a restaurant where they sell alcohol. But that isn't the way it used to be. And I'm sure that these people, they would get out of the hog business. It's an unclean animal. It's basically in de defiance of the Lord Jesus. But you know, when the rich young ruler, this is the reason he didn't want to be saved. This man came to Jesus believing that he was the Messiah, that he was God or had his authority. And Jesus said, well, go sell everything you have. And then come follow me. And he decided he didn't want that. It's not that 
I mean, he probably prayed, thanking God for providing his food and taking care of him and all of it. But when Jesus said, well, let me have control of all of it, he, he wasn't willing to do that. That's frightening to people. And yet in Matthew 16, verse 24 and 25, this is what Jesus says to all of us. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. That's the reason they were asking him to leave. But lost people don't pay attention to what Jesus said in Matthew 19, 28, and 29. Jesus said to them, Very, verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit on the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And every one that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. I mean, you're doing pretty good if you get 10% on your investments. But he's saying 100 times the amount that you invest, you're going to get it. Why don't lost people think about that? Because Satan's not promoting that side of it. And so they seek to escape the presence of the Lord, verse 17. And they begin to pray him to depart out of their coasts. I mean, honestly, if you go to work or go to your family and you've got unsaved people there and they just have a great time with you, it might not be a good sign. You ever think about that? If they're not saved? They want to escape the presence of the Lord. I remember um, years ago, what was the black preacher that we had here? James Earls. James Earls came here to preach, he and his wife. And uh, she was telling about Whitson to one of her neighbors. And this said this woman would always want to see her, and she'd come over, and then... <laughs> Once she got there, apparently just being around somebody that had the Holy Spirit living inside him was more than she could. And she, she had to get away then. If, I think she got saved and she told her that. I always wanted to be around me when I got there. I couldn't take it. I couldn't take being around somebody that was saved and knew the Lord. I had to get away. And so they were praying. They were asking Jesus to leave. But then we see the prayer of the soul that loves God. In verse 18, when he was coming to the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. The others wanted to leave. This man wanted to be with Jesus. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but said unto him, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord had done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. So he's going and tell them, you, you folks are all wrong. Look at me. I'm the same guy that was chasing people, that looked like a hairy ape, that didn't wear clothes. It was trying to hurt myself all the time. By the way, if you know somebody that cuts themselves and things like that, really, I, you, you, you wonder why people have tattoos and all this stuff? That's part of it. It's a self-hatred. But here's a man that prayed and asked the Lord if he could just be with him.
But not only that, he was calm. Here's a guy running around, yelling at people, attacking them. They, they seen the whole herd of pigs killed, and they get there, and this guy's sitting, listening to Jesus. He's in his right mind, clothed. I wonder where he got the clothes from. Well, they probably carried some clothes with them. They were traveling. But he desires to be with Jesus. And with the thing that we note about, he, he basically followed the pattern of prayer that Jesus gave to his disciples. In Matthew 6.10, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He'd already called him the Son of the Most High. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so he comes to Jesus and asks that he can be with him. And Jesus said, no, you need to go out and witness these people. They're scared to death of me. And so what did he do? Well, he did what the Lord told him to do. We've looked at this just recently. Matthew four nineteen. follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. And that's what this man did. And so we have these two prayers. Both people saw the power of God. Displayed unbelievably. And the vast majority of people asked Jesus to leave. You know. A lot of churches don't realize that the reason when they have votes about business, they, they've got different people voting different ways, is because some of them are voting because they don't want the Lord's will done. It, it might take some of their time, it might cost them more money, it might hurt their business. They just don't like it, maybe. Maybe it's because they need to be saved. So what do your prayers reveal about the character and condition of your soul? Again, this fellow had a, a long way to go in growing He's sanctified, he's set apart in Christ, but his life had a lot of sanctity. Of course, just like when I got saved, there were some things that changed immediately, but there are a lot of things that didn't, but he was submitted to the Lord. He was willing to be a witness. He wanted to see other people have the same deliverance that he did. You still have that? I've, it's kind of always been my fault that if somebody, a Christian, is not interested in seeing people delivered from sin, they probably never have been themselves. So two different prayers. One man or two men and two thousand, who knows how many other thousands of people were there. And one wanted to be around Jesus the rest of his life, and the others didn't want him around him at all. Because it would affect their lives. <laughs> They're both praying, just the opposite things. One wants to be with him, the rest want to get rid of him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this record of this mighty act of salvation, power of work of salvation in this man's life. We thank you, Father, that it appears that Jesus went deliberately to meet this man, the, both of the men. We thank you that this passage proves to us that no matter how bad a situation somebody's in, 
that you have power to save them from their sins. And Lord, maybe there's somebody here tonight that's not saved. Maybe they thought it'd be a terrible thing if I had actually gotten saved. And just maybe they're playing along. Lord, to help them to realize that to know you is to have eternal life and to be delivered from all our terrible sins and to have fellowship with the Lord God of heaven and earth. And Lord, help us to be faithful like this man to witness to those around us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right.